Jeff Potter is one of us. He's a geek. Uh, he studied computer science at Brown, done his time in a cube in a startup. He's organized Bard Camp, a Boston-based technology unconference, for and by attendees. And today we've asked him to come talk about his other geek hobby, food. Uh, Jeff's book, Cooking for Geeks, which some of you might have found on your chairs, um, sprung from his passion for food. With no formal culinary training, Jeff wrote a book about food. It's not really a cookbook. It's got a whole chapter on foodborne illness. <laughs> it's conveniently broken into two sections, parasites and bacteria. <laughs> so you can't really classify it like that. Similarly, it's not really one of these detailed recipe porn books where they show you the recipe and they have beautiful pictures. Because he devotes a number of pages to Twitter recipes and publishing in a couple hundred characters a recipe. So um, it's really a book about food that appeals to people who like to overanalyze, kind of like us. All right. Um, I'm happy someone's written a book about food for people like me. I'm hoping today he'll answer my question about why we call them cookies and not babies. When clearly they should be called bakies. Um, and, <laughs> and with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Jeff Potter. Thank you. kind words. Um, I hope I live up, live up to the hype. Um, and of course, there's nothing better for a geek than a Venn diagram. <laughs> so, you know, I get asked a lot, what's a geek? And I'm like, this is the answer to what a geek is. Um, note the slightly clueless bit is not included in the set of things that make a geek up. Um, and for me, that's like really important because people invariably think of pocket protectors and all this other stuff. And you know, that's not what it's about. Um, for me, it's really about curiosity. And as Jeremy was saying, for me, you know, whether it's in front of a computer or in the kitchen, you know, it's really that curiosity about how things work that gets me excited. And so when it comes to cooking, it's exactly the same thing. You know, how does this thing, you know, that we do in the kitchen, how does it actually work? Why do we do the things we do the way we do them? And once you know those things, what can you do that's fun, new, interesting, or just plain delicious? Um, continuing the theme of Venn diagrams, um, figuring that it's Google, I figured that the Google Venn diagram generator was appropriate. Um, you know, putting in things like Windows, Linux, Apple, you can see there are some, some interesting traits. I guess everyone knows why Apple is so popular because people don't seem to search for it. But why is Windows so popular comes up a lot. Hey. Here's another one, which is kind of, you know, a little more interesting. Chefs versus geeks versus bakers. Um, <laughs> geeks clearly don't wear white. Um, I don't quite get the light like bacon bit. <laughs> I would think that would come up under cooks as well. But, you know, man. Then the last one. Um, you know, science, cooking, and food. And the interesting thing for me is all three of these things are important. And I thought it was really nice to actually see that come up. Um, so, a bit about science. And it's always fun to talk about science in the context of dead white dudes. So I present to you three dead white dudes. Um, Aristotle, <laughs> Uh, Newton and Einstein. And the thing that these three guys all have in common is they all came up with models of gravity. And in science, models are really, really important. Um, Aristotle's model is really, really simple. It basically said things like a fall to a natural place. So, you know, a drop that falls, I don't know why it doesn't fall into my mouth, but, um, you know, it's a really simple model and it's not very good. Um, 1800s, you know, we start getting better models. Um, Galileo came up with something, you know, describes basic high school physics for gravity, still taught in high school today. It's pretty good, as a model goes. But it's not actually perfect. Um, it doesn't actually describe Mercury's orbit around the sun, rather famously. And you actually can't describe that with that model. You have to get an even better model, something that Einstein came up with, general relativity. Um, and that actually accounts for Mercury's orbit around the sun. Um, the point here is that with better models, you get better predictions. And that's true in all sciences, and it's true in the kitchen. Um, so let's actually talk about a model of, of cooks, types of cooks. Right now, your model of types of cooks is probably pretty simple. What, how many types of cooks are there? So it's two types. People like to you know, cook things and people like to bake things. But it's actually a really simple model. You know, it's kind of ancient Greece territory in terms of like, yeah, it sounds good, but it doesn't actually really describe what's going on in the kitchen that well. So the researcher down at Cornell got, got some data, looked at thousands of cooks, home cooks, and asked them lots of questions, did, did a factor analysis. And he came up with this five-factor model that describes five different types of cooks that describe most types of cooks. And luckily, he came up with a quiz for it. So here's a quiz. Um, this is a really simple quiz. The way we do this is just keep track of what letter you answer most often. And whatever that letter is at the end, you know that, that's your type. 
Um, it only accounts for about 85 to 90 percent of the population. And given the people in this room, I have my guesses about how this is going to go. <laughs> I will say that under normal populations, it's a roughly 20 percent split between all five types. So keep that in mind when we go through this. <laughs> First question: When I cook a meal, I typically dot dot dot. If anyone needs me to read these off, holler. But you can see I'm great. Are we good? Should I go to the next one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of my favorite ingredients are. Yeah, things from the kitchen around the corner. <laughs> Gingerbread cookies. <laughs> right now, Dave will for me. <laughs> not unusual to you, but me. Um, if it's not unusual to you because of cultural things, then it's not an unusual ingredient. Okay. Shall I go to the next one? Howdy. In my free time, I like to. Okay, I know you guys are great like, what free time, but. <laughs> Next one. My favorite things to cook are. <coughs> Jeremy, are you, are you A on this? Mm. They're good, by the way, thank you. It's your recipe. <laughs> They're delicious. <laughs> Other people describe me as, and the F is a joke. I put that in there at a previous talk. And, um, don't actually answer F. It won't do us any good. <laughs> this only fits 90% of the population, plus or minus some you know, delta. Um, so um, I'm kind of curious to get a show of hands. Um, who here said A? So it's like, let's see, five or six, B? Uh, let's see, there are five or six, uh, C? Let's see, five out seven, okay, D? Yeah, so that's <laughs> it's like half the room. Uh, e? Two, okay, that's cool. So here's what these things mean. Um, the research who did this is Dr. Brian Wansink, who's down at Cornell, and he basically looked at types of cooks. Um, these giving types of cooks are people who basically they basically want to express their affection through baking. Um, so they show up at work with you know, a box full of gingerbread cookies, and what they're really saying is, hey, I love you guys. So you go, thanks, Aww. really cool. Back to so, you know, thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> there you go. It's like, next time someone show, you know, shows up with a plate of brownies, like, that's, what, you know, that's, that's where it's coming from. Um, healthy, this is something you'll go for, like, you know, steamed veggies, brown rice, fish, chicken. You know, to them, food's really about nutritional value, taking care of the body. Um, methodical, this is something, you know, you can give them a recipe and they will nail it perfectly. It'll come out exactly like that recipe says, but if they're like missing one ingredient, like, they don't know what to do. Um, innovative. Um, this is the type of person who basically like, maybe reads a couple of recipes, looks at some TV shows, like walks into the kitchen, throws stuff into a pan, maybe it comes out, if it doesn't, they have a good time doing it. And for them it's just kind of like, hey, I'm just goofing off, playing, and seeing what's going to happen. Um, and that's really how I like to cook as well. And then finally this competitive type. This is somebody who, like, for them, cooking is almost an act of expressing who they are as a personality. You know, grilling, um, things that are a little bit chest thumping, if that makes sense. Um, you know, it's totally cool. No, no, that's it by that. Um, but for them, it's as much about the act of cooking and you know, doing that in kind of a competitive realm. Um, so that all said, you know, we started with a really simple model. It's like two types of cooks. But here's a better model. And once you have this better model, you can start making better predictions. So. You can imagine a couple, you know, maybe somebody who is really health driven, married to somebody who's really about expressing affection. So, you know, the girlfriend <laughs> makes the boyfriend a tray, a tray of brownies, saying, hey, I love you. And the guy's like, oh my god, this isn't fish and veggies. Like, oh my god, no. And like, you can just see, like, there's conflict that like, comes up around food. Like, I mean, food is such a thing, like, you're laughing about this, presumably because this is true for you. <laughs> you have this very pain. <laughs> Now, with this better model, you'll understand what's going on. It's like, hey, it's like, I mean, like, it's really powerful to have that better model because, besides breaking down on the front row of an audience, and, you know, now we'll have to talk about it, and you know it's not an offense. Um, so, you know, that, that whole bit of, of models are really, really powerful. Um, you know, science in general really does rely on these two things, theory and data, and I say this a lot. 
And a lot of people go, yeah, yeah of course, I understand this in science, but they don't think about this in the context of the kitchen. You know, without your, your data, your theories are really no good. You don't know if they're true or not. Without your theories, well, you just have a pile of data. You can't predict new data points that you don't have in your set of, of observations. Um, same thing's true in food. Here is a model and equation for knowing when meat is done being cooked. <laughs> I can't read this. I confess I am not a theory guy. My background is much more on the data side of things. So when it comes to the kitchen, I like to gather data. So I'll do things like this. I'll go into the kitchen, take a lump of chocolate chip cookie dough, throw a probe into it, throw it in the oven, and see what happens and start recording data. So what's your model right now tell you about what happens to a lump of cookie dough when you throw it in the oven? It cooks. I've had somebody go, it turns into a cookie. You hold that in a box, you put dough in, and cookies come out. You put an apple in, and the cookie does not come out. Um, so let's talk about cookie dough. Something I mean, that's kind of interesting. Um, so, you know, I throw this probe in. This little line right here you barely see is actually a little probe thermometer. It's like kitchen, you know, $30 thermometer. It's something you've got at home. Um, so, around 92 degrees, it begins to kind of spread out and do that thing that you were saying. Right? Um, that's the temperature at which butter begins to melt. So like, right, okay, this makes some sense. There's some structure holding this, this massive dough together, and the structure starts to go, and the butter starts to go. Okay, cool. Around 212 degrees, um, the edge of the cookie begins to set up. And it starts, you know, again, 212 degrees, kind of an obvious number, boiling point of water. And then the edge of that cookie begins to steam up. It's also around the temperature at which a lot of starches and things like flour <coughs> begin to actually like, melt and like, do their thing as well. Uh, then around 310 degrees, the outside of this cookie begins to turn light brown. Any guesses what's happening around 310? A good guess, but not the right one. Maillard? Oh. Yes. Who's that Maillard? Extra ginger bread cookie to the man in green. <laughs> um, the Maillard reaction is a breakdown between uh, proteins and simple sugars. Basically, these two things break down, form hundreds of new compounds, some of which are brown, some of which smell really, really good, and we happen to like. Um, if that doesn't do it for you, think about taking a slice of bread and toasting it. That toasted smell that you get, that's the Maillard reaction. And it's really important in cooking because it brings a whole set of flavors. So think about things like Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are universally boiled and universally hated because the flavor is kind of bland. Um, if you quarter them, throw some olive oil, some salt in there, yes. and put them under a broiler, you get this <laughs> nice toasted, rich, brown outside that has those great flavors in my reaction. And that's responsible for a lot of flavor in foods. And once you start realizing this is a temperature-dependent reaction, you now realize, right, cooking methods that don't get that hot won't trigger that reaction. So you have to get your foods that hot to get that reaction. So if you're thinking about steaming or boiling something, well, you don't have to get that set of flavors. Then around 356, 360, somewhere in that territory, our cookie begins to turn even darker brown. And this is from caramelization, as you guys were guessing earlier. Uh, and this is just the pure breakdown of sucrose and other sugar molecules. Um, this temperature I'm giving you is for sucrose specifically. Uh, basically, it's just the sugar molecule itself is decomposing and then forming hundreds of compounds, again, some of which are brown, some of which smell good. Um, and it's, it's surprising in hindsight for me, looking at the book and working on it, how long it took to understand some really like basic duh type things. Um, caramelization has nothing to do with melting. It just happens that sugar melts around the same temperature point that it breaks down and decomposes. Um, fun fact, um, sugar melts at around 367. Actually, it's a pure substance, so it melts at 367. So you can actually calibrate your oven using sugar, just like you use an ice cube to you know if your freezer is you know, above 32 or below 32. Same thing with your oven. If you put sugar in your oven at 350, it shouldn't melt. If you put your oven at 375, it, it should melt. You start looking at recipes and say, hey, some recipes call for things being cooked at 325 or 350, and other recipes at 375. There's this nice like break point between these two sets of temperatures, and that is the chemical reactions that sugar go through, both melting and caramelization. So here's a nice little visual proof of this. Um, I just took some sugar dough, and it's kind of hard to see in the projector. Um, but basically, I just took some sugar cookie dough and baked it at different temperatures. And you can see there's a really nice you know, difference between that 350 and 375 that where it starts to get brown. <coughs> Uh, a note on these temperatures, they're not exact points, these are rate of reactions. Um, so like, caramelization actually kind of picks up the hotter you go, but it's not really visibly occurring until around a little bit north of 350. Um, so, better model than your simple model of cookie dough to cookie, right? Next time you're going to make cookies, you can think about things like, hey, do I want the outside to be brown, in the case of something like a chocolate chip cookie, or do I want it to be like, you know, not so brown, in the case of something like a sugar cookie or an oatmeal cookie. Same thing's true with me. Another model for you here. Um, when you cook meat, what happens? Jeweler, jeweler. Browns. Yeah, the outside birds. Browns. The what? The outside birds in the United States. Yes, you get textual breakdowns of different proteins being of the nature. 
Um, and specifically, at least in the papers I've been able to find, it seems like there are different proteins that are responsible for this, some of which we happen to like being denatured and cooked, and some of which we happen to like being in their native, uncooked state. Um, specifically, the two ones are myosin and actin. Uh, different types of meats have uh, different variants of these proteins, and the temperatures vary a little bit. But essentially, for something like steak, it looks like around 122 degrees, one of these proteins, myosin, begins to denature, and in the process of denaturation, changes its texture, changes the way it tastes, and the way you perceive it, and we happen to like that change. And if you look at another protein, one called actin, it begins to go somewhere around 150, and unlike myosin, when it denatures and changes its texture, it gets tough and dry and not so delicious. If you look at things like medium rare steak, it's at this temperature point, like 135, 140, where you're basically getting one of those proteins cooked and another one uncooked. So suddenly it's like, oh, right, this thing is about the, the particular reactions that are occurring at particular temperatures. It's not so much about the time that you let your meat at you know, whatever temperature you're cooking it, but really the actual temperature of the meat itself and what it comes up to. Um, so when you take that, that piece of meat, let's say you take a steak tip and you drop it into a pan, you get something that looks kind of like this. Um, again, it's kind of hard to see the projector. Basically, there's this gradient of done this where you know, it's kind of, well, this particular example is basically rare in the middle. It's like medium rare and kind of well done out here, and then you know, it's the outside brown from the Maillard direction we were talking about earlier. So one question I get asked a lot here at this point is, well, why are we told to always cook things to 165 degrees? I mean, if the proteins in here are really ideal at 135, 140, like, why is it we're constantly hammered with this Y165 number? And the reason for this is this. <laughs> Salmonella, um, and other foodborne illness, um, definitely not a fun thing to come down with, and one of the main reasons we cook food is to make it safe for us to eat. Um, the standard rule that's actually given in, in food safety uh, is something called the danger zone. It basically says don't hold food between 140 and 140 for more than two to four hours. It depends upon what state you're in. The laws for food safety are actually state by state. But essentially, kind of in that time window, in that temperature range, you, know, you start running into problems. Now you'll notice there's this nice little square wave here that's like the simple model of what's going on. And there's a little dotted line, which is actually kind of a better model of what's really going on, which is essentially that bacteria like to multiply at different temperatures and different rates. And it happens that things like salmonella reproduce best at body temperature. And what food safety people are concerned about is the quantity of these pathogens that, that are present. It's not really like your food is either safe or unsafe. It's really a probability of how unsafe is it. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, a little icky to think about at first, but once you understand it's really about probability and odds, you can start understanding how to mitigate those risks and actually, you know, correctly take into account those odds and start doing some fun things. Um, so you don't have to just take my word for it. Um, in terms of things like cooking foods below 140, you can actually do this, um, even according to the, the people that set these guidelines. So the Food Safety Inspectional Services has a table that says, here's how long you're supposed to cook foods at various temperatures. If you want to cook your chicken at 136 degrees, you can do that. You just have to hold it at that temperature for over an hour to make sure it's properly pasteurized. So it's really about reducing the quantity of pathogens that are present to a sufficiently safe level, such that it's not likely to hurt you. Um, now, why would you want to do this? Well, we were talking about myosin and actin a few minutes ago, and it comes to this texture of the proteins. If you can get something to a point where it's safe to eat, but you haven't denatured the actin, well, you're not saying it's delicious and safe, and that's always the end goal. So, a simple model, cooking meat to 165, and by meat, it's really usually poultry. Um, the better model is really 140 degrees is okay, as long as you hold it correctly to pasteurize it. So, once you do this, you can do fun things like this. You'll see the piece of meat on the right is basically medium rare, the whole thing, center to edge. You'll also notice the outside has no brown crust on the outside because it's got no Maillard reaction. Um, any guesses as to how I did this? Yeah, like I asked this like two years ago, and people would be like, what? Um, yeah, this is called sous vide cooking. Um, it's a really simple concept. It basically says, hold your food in an environment that's at the target temperature that you want to cook something to. So if you take a piece of meat and you want to get that steak to say 140 degrees, Instead of putting it into a 300 degree oven, you can put it into an environment that's 140 degrees. And eventually it will come up to a temperature of 140 degrees. Uh, it works great for eggs. Hey. Um, no worries. Uh, are there any gingerbread cookies left? No, we ran out right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it really comes down to the CV stuff that it's really about the temperature that you're trying to get your material to, kind of your target temperature. And the benefit of this is that you can't overcook things because you're not talking about an environment that's hotter. So if you've got that actin protein in, in meat, for example, that doesn't really begin to go until 150, well, if you put it in an environment that's 140, it never gets to be 150. That reaction never triggers, so you can't overcook things. 
Um, eggs are a great example of this. Um, so this is my setup at home. This is called an immersion recirculator. It's basically a piece of fancy lab gear that keeps water at a particular temperature and it's got a little propeller to agitate it. Um, more on that in a little while. Um, but the eggs themselves work out really, really well this way. Think about the temperatures that are involved in an egg. You know, you drop that egg in a normal cooking situation to a pan of boiling water. And it kind of does this and gets hotter and hotter, right? And like five or seven minutes in, you basically pull it out, you know, somewhere right around here. Right in that really, really narrow band that's the ideal temperature range for eggs. And hopefully, you know, you time it right. Um, the 144 and 158 refer to the two temperature points at which proteins and eggs begin to denature, and kind of the upper limit where you, you know, most of them have actually set. So like a, a really good soft poached egg is somewhere in that range. And depending upon how well you, uh, you like your egg set, you know, it's going to be somewhere between there. Um, there's, you know, 50, 60 different types of proteins in the egg, and they all kind of denature in that range. Um, this is the sort of thing where you can you know, have fun playing with it one degree at a time, just to kind of see what your, your perfect egg is. Um, the thing about doing it sous vide style is that you set your temperature in your bath, you put your egg in, and the egg just kind of ramps up in temperature and finally reaches that ideal temperature point. But it, it never ever cooks. So you get this egg that you know is essentially perfectly soft poached and just you kind of sit there for a couple hours. So if you're like trying to cook brunch for like you know 30, 40 people, you just put a bucket out, put your eggs in, set the temperature, and walk away and forget about it. And like they won't ever cook. Um, the key to making sure that the one thing I want you to really understand to hammer home is that it's the temperature that's important. Here. <coughs> time is just kind of a, a proxy for temperature. You, know, you put those cookies in your oven and you time it for 12 minutes. Well, it's really about how long does it take for that mass of dough to come up to a certain temperature at the, you know, at the uh, temperature of your oven. But it's really the temperature of the actual mass that matters. Uh, so here's a photograph of an egg that's been cooked this way. Um, it's kind of hard to see, so here's a video of it. Um, another cool thing about doing eggs this way is that there's one layer of the egg on the outside that doesn't actually set up to a higher temperature, so the egg just kind of falls out of the shell when you do this. It's like totally awesome. <laughs> um, and you'll see me come in with a spoon here and then kind of see the texture. The yolk and the white have almost the same texture. They're both kind of like mayonnaise-like consistency when cooked at a certain point. Um, there you go. Yeah, and they're delicious. I mean, like, if there's one thing you can go home and try, it's like sous vide eggs, definitely, hands down. Uh, so this is the piece of gear that I have. Um, it's called an immersion recirculator, and it's kind of expensive. Um, you know, three, four years ago, this was kind of the only way of really doing it, but there are now better ways of doing this. Uh, there's a consumer device out called the sous vide supreme. They're like three or four hundred dollars. If you've got the counter space and the cash, they're certainly very easy, and they look nice next to your other stainless steel appliances. Um, <laughs> but if you're like me, pair of wire cutters, <laughs> well, this works. <coughs> works really well. Um, just take a crock pot or any slow cooker, interpose on the power supply, rig up your own thermocoupler, and drop in a you know, thermostat controller, um, and you're, you're good to go. Um, and it's actually incredibly easy. Um, and I get questions a lot of times about, well, there's no circulator, you know, there's nothing to agitate the water. Well, for whatever reason, it seems that, at least for the stuff I've done in a slow cooker, the heat source in the bottom is over a large enough area that there's really no gradient heat <coughs> inside the container. You don't have to worry about it so much. Oh, one other thing I, I um, neglected to mention earlier. Um, when you pull that piece of meat out, you know, it didn't have that brown outside. There's no mild reaction on that. And that's like one of the really, you know, good key characteristics of a really good steak. So what we do is after you take it out of the sous vide environment, you then drop it into a pan and you sear the outside. So you're basically still getting that reaction on the outside, but you've taken the, the two reactions, um, the external temperature and the interior temperature, and you basically are controlling for them independently of each other. So you're not having to kind of race the outside temperature and the inside temperature. So you're saying earlier you're always like overcooking the outside and the middle's rare. Yeah. Sounds like your environment's too hot. Yeah. So try cooking at a lower temperature. Um, that'd be my, my guess. Um, so kind of in summary, I mean if there is kind of a, a high level couple of bullet points you'll you know hopefully remember tomorrow or next week. This is kind of it. You know, some models, some predictions, I'm not gonna help you recover when disaster strikes. Um, better models, better predictions. Um, and, and really, you know, for, for me, a lot of it comes down to just being curious in the kitchen. If, if you walk into the kitchen, you're like, hey, you know, how does this actually work? What's going on here? Um, and you're not sure, well, do an experiment. I mean, it's really easy to gather data in your kitchen. And if you're talking about cookies and you're not sure about the difference between melted butter versus, you know, uh, room temp or even fridge temp butter when you're making your cookie batch, like, just make two batches and do them side by side and see what the difference is. Because, you know, you're going to learn a lot more about what's going on in that process just by actually trying it. And you can sit there and have you know, lots of guesses, but until you actually try something and see what comes out, well, you're not going to really be sure. Um, there's this great quote that I saw years ago that, that really kind of strikes home for me in a lot of these things. Um, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, and in practice, there is. 
Um, the reason for this is there's always a delta between what your theory predicts and what really happens in real life. The thing is with the better model, that delta gets smaller and smaller. And so, you know, there always will be a difference, but hopefully by understanding some of the science, um, that difference will be, you know, easier to understand and even smaller. Um, so with that, um, I figured that it'd be much more fun to actually open this up as a conversation and, and talk about questions you guys might have. Hopefully I've given you lots of ideas, um, aware of, you know, topics we can talk about. But I'm totally happy to hang out for the next half hour and like answer questions and you know strategize about whatever questions you might have about how to figure out answers about it. Um, so with that, thanks. Jeremy. Uh, you mentioned that people uh, prefer, to prefer tastes uh, as the proteins change at different temperatures. Is that evolutionary? I mean, is that like, uh, has any studies been done that show that like we like it tasting better because it has less bacteria, therefore we live longer, blah, 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 blah? Um, I don't think that that's been done. I don't know how you would do that. The textual preference of meat stuff is um, it's definitely a personal preference based upon what you kind of grew up with. Okay. So it's the reason why, if, you know, if you look at um, older people, they tend to actually prefer their meats cooked, you know, well done or well. They don't like that medium rare texture. Um, a lot of that comes down to, as we've learned more about food safety, um, we've relaxed the rules. It's like actually just recently in the last few months, it's now considered safe to cook your pork to 145 as opposed to 165. That's because trichinosis, which was a concern in pork originally, it's basically not in our meat supply, at least here in the U.S. So it's kind of the same thing with, with meat texture stuff, where it's like, well, you know, two generations ago, people really cooked it to make sure they weren't going to get anything. Now we kind of know, no, actually, it's okay to go you know, colder. Um, I don't know about being able to show it's biologically, evolutionarily. Um, I think it's more cultural than anything. Um, good question, though. Okay. Well, your your uh, seminal of food safety graph, I noticed the dotted line was still non-zero below freezing. Yes. How far below freezing does it have to go before it's actually zero? Um, pretty gosh darn cold. Um, for things that deal with um, food safety, um, that dotted line really isn't so much a concern, but uh, spoiler bacteria, it is. This is why if you put things in your fridge, you know, they eventually go bad. Because, right. you know, clearly something's multiplying at that temperature range. I don't know below freezing at what point it actually ceases to be. I think there are some that even at freezer temp can be an issue, which is why the guidelines say not to hold foods in your freezer for more than six months. Um, so I think there actually is some stuff that can come up, but it's such a slow rate that most people don't get into impractical limits. Um, that's a good question to look up in the, the more detail. Um, the thing about um, that dotted line on the high side is that um, really the highest temperature is, uh, I think it's 130 months of the still serious, like the next high is 122. So I mean, this is kind of a cartoon one, it's not, obviously it's not a specific bacteria. But the thing is, none of these things really multiply about 131-ish. So holding food at 140 is actually safer than 40, if you think about it. So 40, you know, they actually can't multiply, they can't be around. It's, it's, the rate's so slow that it's not really an issue with how we consume it. But you know, given the choice between eating beef stew that's been held at 140 degrees for six weeks versus held at 40 degrees for six weeks, I take the 140 degree. Because um, basically at that point, you know, it's, it's yeah. sterilized. It's, yeah. it's completely sterilized. It's held long enough. Uh, in sous vide, though, you're bringing it up to the temperature much more slowly which right. means it spends more time in that bulge of, the, of this curve, Mark. Yeah, so it's a, that's a really good question, which is the sous vide stuff. You know, when you drop it in, basically you're dropping it in from fridge temperature, and you know, it has to traverse this entire span, and it takes, you know, however, whatever, whatever length of time. Um, this is, generally isn't a problem in sous vide, because you normally portion the foods to individual portion size, and so the actual food comes up to temperature pretty quickly. Um, if you take, like, I don't know, a, this is a number of like a six ounce steak and you drop it in and it's at 40 degrees, it's going to get up to temp pretty fast. Um, if you took five pounds of chuck roast that had been frozen, like that's, like don't do that. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the reason for that is that the center of that is going to be between you know, that 40 and that 140 for such a length of time that depending upon what your environment is, you know, there's just some pretty huge variables in there that, you know, it's just going to sit too long at a bad temperature. Um, I should probably add a little asterisk here and say things like uh, steak, um, are other meats that are called whole, um, whole muscle intact. Um, the center of those pieces of meat are actually sterile. So in those cases, you really only care about the surface because you worry about surface contamination during um, butchering, slaughtering, and transport work in your kitchen. So this is why it's okay to do things like take your steak, sear the outside, and then serve it rare. Because even though the middle is essentially in a rare case, you know, even let's say at 120 degrees, like obviously well below that, that safety point, it's sterilized because it hasn't been actually contaminated. 
Um, so things like Crown Hamburger, though, where you know Crown Hamburger is all outside, there is no inside. Like I've secretly wanted to go to like a food safety convention and like serve hamburgers and ask the people, how do you want this cooked medium rare? Because like nobody should want their hamburger cooked medium rare because it's at a temperature which you know you haven't actually properly pasteurized any pathogens that might be present. Um, I will note that you can properly pasteurize hamburgers to medium rare using sous vide cooking. Um, so you know that's where having better sense of the models comes into play because you can start doing some fun stuff like you know not worry about serving it to somebody expected. Um, go for it. You could presumably get away with it if you knew the meat was ground immediately before you cooked it too. Yes, if you have control over the, the you know the. Oh, I mean it also depends upon what the source contamination is at that point. Um, I mean. Yeah, if you're grinding it yourself, yeah, you've got a lot more control over it. Um, then you sear the outside. Yeah, if you grinder. sear the outside, <laughs> then you have a completely sterilized grinder. You know, this is called beef tartare, and you know, you serve it at restaurants. Um, I mean, as long as it's clean, you're fine going in. But a lot of the food safety stuff, it, it basically assumes the worst case scenario. You know, like, let's just assume this piece of poultry is infected with salmonella to the you know worst possible degree, and now we need to reduce um, the log D, the term is log D reduction. You know, we need to do through a seven-fold reduction. You know, only one out of a million are going to survive after cooking. <laughs> like that's then safe. Like that's the numbers they give you. Um, so I mean, their concern is safety, not not taste and texture. That's where the balance always comes into play. Uh, in the green shirt. So on, on the topic of sous vide taking a long time to come up to temperature, has anyone in the sous vide community looked at a trick that I think homebrewers have used a long time, where you say Oh, if I want, you know, some stuff that I dump in a bath of hot water to be at a particular temperature, I approximate the stuff by room temperature water and make the water extra hot so that when I dump it in, the the um, yeah, temperature is after everything has settled <coughs> out is going to be going to be the one we want. This is a good idea, and um, I'm sure it would help uh, in theory. <laughs> in practice, when your container of water is this big, and the food you're putting in, you know, is already at 40 and you're only going to 140, it's 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 not actually a problem being the food to temperature quickly enough. Um, the bigger problem that does come up with sous vide stuff is um, once you get it to temperature, and uh, the question is then what do you do with it? So, you know, if you're a restaurant and you're doing something that you know you're going to bring it up the temperature and you're going to put it in the fridge, and the next day you're going to take it out and heat it back up. You're now traversing that span like three times, and it's a cumulative time that ends up mattering unless you actually properly sterilize it by the time you know, get the temp, which isn't going to happen in this case. Um, so in that case, you know, the, the, there's a whole set of guidelines called uh, HCAP. Um, I can't remember it's HCAP, Hazardous Control and something point I think. Um, basically, it says if you see these stuff, um, there's kind of two methods. There's one that's a cook serve, and one's called cook chill. With cooked chill, you basically need to cook it and then chill it as fast as possible. Like dump it into an ice bucket that's got you know ice and a little bit of water to get it down really really quickly. Um, so in those cases, you know you start worrying about the temperature stuff and playing with you know how quickly you move the temperature back and forth. But if you basically do what's called cook serve, where you cook it and then you put it on a plate and you ship it out, I mean like sous vide stuff at restaurants is great. If you know, somebody orders you know the steak, you've got it in a plastic bag that's in your you know your sous vide setup. It's got maybe some marinated in the bag, so it tastes good too, right? You pull it out, you set the bag open, you sear, you know, for 30 seconds on the side, you drop it on the plate, and you ship it out. Like, you don't have to wait for cooking it because it's already cooked. Um, so the cooked serve stuff, I think, is, is really easy to do at home. Cook, cook chill stuff, just make sure you get it cold enough, cook enough. Um, there's a really good guide online. Um, Douglas Baldwin has this, uh, a sous vide a guide. Um, if you just Google, like, sous vide um, Douglas Baldwin, you'll find it. It's a great page that details, like, everything down to, like, I mean, it, it, he's done a fantastic job of coming through the literature and coming up with great tables. Um, so that's where I point people to. Um, how does contamination and danger <coughs> zone and such vary with vegetables, with non-meats? Yeah. You're more likely to get foodborne illness from your veggies than you are from your meats at this point. That's the number one factor. We don't cook lettuce. You know, if you think about all the salmonella outbreaks that have happened, it's been things like spinach than things where you know you're not actually, you know, adding heat to it. Um, wash your veggies. I mean, really, wash your veggies. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. But even <laughs> like even cooked vegetables, like cooked vegetables should keep a whole lot longer than cooked meats because you don't have 
they're less likely to be contaminated? Is that true or no? Um, well, it's not just contamination. Um, I, I, things like bacteria need a bunch of different variables to be able to survive. Um, for, for bacteria, the standard acronym is called BATOM. Um, F is for food, you know, something to munch on, and veggies certainly have plenty of nutrients. Um, there's other things like acidity, pH, temperature, time. Um, I don't know specifically between, you know, a container of veggies and a container of meat in your fridge, which is going to go faster. I know in my fridge it's not a problem because I will eat it faster than the bacteria will. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a good so idea. So they're really comparable, it's just we're more aware of meat. People are very afraid about getting sick from meat that is not properly cooked. They should be more worried about getting sick from veggies that have not been properly washed. I think that's a pretty safe statement. Uh, well, I now have a follow-up to that question, which is, uh, do you have any, I mean, is there any special procedure for properly washing the vegetables? Google it. <laughs> and, uh, it seems like it ought to be possible, so uh, turkey brining is a special big fat that comes up every Thanksgiving. It seems like it should be possible to sous vide your turkey in the brine. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is Have you seen people do that? I, I've um, slow cooked, you can actually use a slow cooker um, with something like a turkey leg. Oh, let's see, long rambling tangent. Okay, actin, myosin, important things. So another protein called collagen. Um, meats that are really high in collagen um, are things like duck legs, um, short ribs. These kinds of meats, the collagen has to be basically broken down, hydrolyzed, and denatured, and that takes like a long time, which is why if you're doing something like duck confit, like you have to cook it for six, eight hours. Um, and the temperature of the collagen goes to like 165, 180, I mean, that's a greater reaction. But it's higher than those minus and active points. Um, if you take a turkey leg, you put it in water, throw a tablespoon or two of salt in that, put it in your slow cooker, turn it on for a day, it will come back to a day later to like an amazing like turkey leg that's like perfectly bright and everything. Um, you don't need to throw that much salt in though. Not enough salt that would actually inhibit bacterial growth as far as I know. So, I mean, obviously salt and water is going to, I mean, this is how you do things like you know, blocks or cure certain fish, you know, is by basically taking the salinity to a high enough level where the bacteria cell, like, literally rush or, like, destroy the cells. Um, I don't know if you could actually, like, cook a turkey in just salt and have it be food safe. Like, turkey jerky, I guess? I mean, <laughs> I'm sure it's doable, but it just doesn't sound like something I would, I don't know, run and go and buy, but it could work in theory. Try it, let me know. <laughs> so, not to move from food safety, but uh, I'm curious what we know about the signs of what flavors go together. So I had a, a friend come over to my house and looked at my not particularly extensive spice rack and said, do you actually know how to use all of those? And I said, yes. But when he asked, like, what, how do you know what goes with what? I had no answer for him whatsoever other than experience. So it seems that chemical similarity of compounds is predictive of how well the flavors will go together. And there's a great website called Food Pairings where this guy has done a whole bunch of chemical analysis and you give it an ingredient and it tells you what's similar to it. Um, somewhere in the book is a couple of screenshots from it in chapter three on page number... Well, I got one, so... I'm trying to <laughs> It's food pairings. If you go to food pairings, you'll find it. Um, here we go. It should be, yeah. Page 143. So you'll see in the top of that uh, are two little diagrams. Look we'll at that. Um, so yeah, um, flavors that go together seem to be based on chemical similarity. Um, the way that our noses smell things, um, well, sense of taste and smell are, are totally, truly fascinating. It's like there's there's so much that goes on. Um, taste is relatively straightforward. There's chemical receptors in your tongue that we, uh, are able to kind of fire off for like five or six different types of um, categories of compounds. So some things taste sweet, some things are bitter, sour, umami, all these things. Um, maybe metallic ions are still kind of a question mark for human tongues. They found uh, receptors for that in dog tongues. It's probably the reason that some of us have receptors for it as well. Smell is a lot more complicated. Um, you notice that it's somewhere in the order of like 10,000 different receptors that kind of key off different aspects of the a molecule, at least this is the current theory, and um, any given molecule will kind of trigger a different number of receptors. So it's kind of like a chord of a piano where you hear certain notes. Mm -hmm. And so the theory, as far as I understand it, is that compounds that strike similar notes, just like they would chord-wise in a symphony, go well together, will likewise go well together in food. Um, so this is why things like, if you look at I don't know, basil and tomato, 
Um, they'll do a lot together because they literally have similar chemicals and similar chemical families that strike the same receptors in your nose. Um, and likewise, this is why it's really hard to do things like chocolate and lobster go well together. <laughs> it's like they just like they uh, don't. Yeah, right. You know, it's like it's like you know a C, C sharp you know chord along with like a B flat. Like it's just dissonant. Um, so if you actually look at some of the more interesting um, combinations of ingredients that are done at some of the high end restaurants occasionally. A lot of it comes out of actually looking at food pairings, and a lot of the top end chefs will go and look at food pairings and go, "Oh, you know, we can do strawberry, you know, with you know these particular other ingredients, and it works." Um, so yeah, I mean, go and try and play with it. All right. So does this mean I should go back and tell my friend who had a challenge for generating three pairwise uh, delicious combinations that do not go well together to give up? No. no, no, there are plenty of, there are plenty of combinations. Um, but using this, you could probably come up with a really good list of three pairwise combinations that don't work together. Um, I remember... Um, chicken and basil and chicken and cinnamon are both good, but you wouldn't put chicken and basil and cinnamon in the dish. Right. Chicken and basil and cinnamon are thick. So A and B are good. B and C are good. C and A are good. So the guy that did these, Bernard Lajos, I remember him saying to me at one point, that I think you can bridge like, you can kind of like jump four things, but I think it was like uh, five jump points, like they didn't work anymore. I mean, he's a great guy, like email him and say, I would love to figure out how to come up with a combination of three wise pairs that don't work together chemically as a joke of my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and then send me the list too. <laughs> this one, you talked about safe heating. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about safety frosting, or does that not even matter if you're going to be cooking it afterwards anyway? Um, safety frosting basically amounts to defrosted in its temperature range. This is why if you've got frozen ground turkey, they say put it in your fridge overnight, because you know below 40, above 32, it's going to defrost, but your multiple uh, multiplication rate of bacteria is slow enough that you're not having any real concern there. So if you're trying to defrost fish over like an hour time period, for example, you don't have like the whole night to Put it in water, water, put it in cold water. Yeah, water conducts heat a lot faster than air. So if you took that, that lump of frozen fish and you put it on your counter at 60 degrees, you put it in a bath of water at 40 degrees in your fridge, and you put it in a, bath, uh, a third piece in, a, in your fridge just in the air, the one that's in water at 40 degrees is going to be frost fastest. Um, this is actually why when you do sous vide stuff, you do it in a water bath or a liquid bath. And you could technically do sous vide in your oven if your oven went to those temperatures. It just would take 23 times longer. And because of that, you run to, you know, too much time in that danger zone window. Um, so like fish, I mean, keep in mind that that danger window is, is, you know, it's like four hours. If you put it on your counter defrost for two hours and you cook it and you eat it an hour later, you need to probably fine. I mean, assuming you're starting with a fish that isn't like been slathered with salmonella or something. <laughs> but actually, with fish, you know, it's, it's really parasites that are concerned, and freezing kills parasites. So actually, like really, really good, like high-end tuna. Like, well, actually, tuna's not an issue for other reasons, but like, say salmon. Like, it'll actually have been frozen to kill any parasites, because then you're not concerned about, you know, being ill. Bacteria obviously don't die when you freeze them. I mean, you store bacteria in labs by putting the samples in a freezer. This, that's how you preserve them. Um, not so with parasites. So, um, the issue is with shellfish in general is parasites. So, I mean, not that you should leave the fish out of your counter all day long, it's kind of gross, but um, yeah, I think you're probably okay. What was the biggest kitchen disaster you've ever had? Um, <laughs> I think I've got a slide on this somewhere. <laughs> um, there's one I'm not allowed to talk about publicly yet. So um, let's just say it involves some TV cameras. Um, I'm not able to find this very fast. Let me see. Actually, it might be here. Is Are you it? looking for your oven? Yeah. I found it. Uh, it's for Jeff Potter high temperature pizza. Man, you Google employees are scary, so you got to plug right in your head. <laughs> um, I, I actually pre-searched that last night. Oh, you pre-cached it? Yeah. That's really yeah. scary. So where's the file on my hard drive? <laughs> it's predictive. Um, uh, here we go. This should be it. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, sort of. Maybe. I don't know if this is going to be very useful. Um, I will show you a, 
a photograph, and then talk about it. So here's the um, here's here's the photograph. I'll wait for the words cleaning cycle to pop into everyone's <laughs> yeah. Pizza. Um, it turns out you can make really really good pizza if your oven goes to about 900 degrees. And your oven goes to about 900 degrees. Actually, hotter than that, but it's a cleaning cycle. Um, there's this guy down in Atlanta, a guy named Jeff Arasano, who first did this maybe a decade ago, where he clips the lock in his oven door so he can open it when it's on cleaning cycle. Um, I, you know, in, in the interest of readers and research, I replicate this to home. Not that you should. You really don't need to. Um, it does make good pizza, though. Um, so that's an infrared thermometer. Basically, it tells you the surface temperature of things, and it says 845 degrees. Um, there's a, a, a marked difference between like 800 degrees and 600 degrees. I can put my hand in the oven at 600 degrees, and it's, it's warm. But like 800 degrees is kind of like, you almost have an involuntary reaction to pull your hand back. Um, but the thing about doing pizza in an oven this hot is that it cooks like in 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you drop it in, it goes, sets, and you pull it out. Um, you also have about a two second window between undercooked and overcooked. Um, but if you ever wonder how you get a really, really good thin crust pizza, it's by basically cooking it in a really hot environment. So if you go over to like Harvard Square where there's Cambridge One, you know, they're cooking on top of a charcoal wood grill. And I took my bird thermometer when they weren't looking, pointed at it, and it reads about a thousand degrees. So the difference between the commercial pizza makers that are making these really delicious thin crust pizzas and you at home is their oven just goes really hot. That's why you can't normally do it at home. Um, so here's the sliding question. Um, one of these is a surviving pane of glass from my oven door. The other one is a piece of Pyrosram 3, which is um, quartz crystal. It's what the military used on missile nose cones in the 1950s. <laughs> Thank you, Google. It's amazing where you can find the internet. <laughs> What's even more amazing to me is that it was cheaper than the replacement piece of glass from the oven that <laughs> And my oven now safely goes to a thousand degrees. <laughs> um, since I'm yeah renting my place out, I have removed my lock the heat mechanism. Um, heck, why I'm at it, I'm also show this slide to ask you about negative three hundred twenty degrees. Uh, I apologize that I, I did not bring my liquid nitrogen container with me today, um, because you can make really really delicious ice cream in about thirty seconds, just like you can make pizza in thirty seconds. Um, and basically, you think about temperature. We're talking about earlier about the, the temperature of foods, the temperature that matters. When you start dealing with extreme temperatures, either really hot or really, really cold, you can take that mass of food to your target temperature and beyond really, really fast. Um, the thing that's kind of cool about doing it with liquid nitrogen is that there are certain things like ethanol that don't freeze under normal ice cream making conditions that do freeze at this temperature range. So you can make ice cream that is literally you know, strong enough to give you, from one scoop, will give you a hangover. <laughs> and it's delicious. Um, I highly recommend. Um, this is the part where you have to delete me saying this. To what extent does the humidity of your oven matter? It matters. Um, <laughs> there's no control for it, right? You have to figure something out if you want. Well, yeah, I mean, this is why bakers will oftentimes, you know, like spritz or spray water in their oven, or you'll sometimes see recipes that say, you know, put a tray of water. I mean, humidity is one of the big uncontrolled variables in baking especially. It's something that we just don't really deal with, because it's kind of hard to control for, at least with the tools we have you know, today. You know, maybe in 20 or 30 years, you know, our ovens will have the humidity knob next to the temperature knob, which would be really actually kind of cool. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's really an issue for dry cooking methods. Anytime you're baking or roasting, you know, because obviously water imparts heat a lot faster. You've got more moisture in the environment. You know, it's going to heat the outside of your food faster. So it's transfer the heat quicker. Um, so yeah, it matters. I mean, because well, I was thinking if, if you <laughs> talk about like cooking something for longer, there's you know the chance that it'll dry out. <laughs> Oil. <laughs> I'm pragmatic. I, don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, I know that you can control certain points of humidity, especially for baking, like like melted butter versus cold butter. If you use cold butter, you can do stuff in the oven longer because it takes a longer time for the fat to melt in the butter. Right. So then, then it melts out, and that's why you can leave it in longer. And if, but it also takes longer for the cookie. Like if you're making cookies, it takes longer for the cookie to spread as well. So if you use liquid fats, they spread really fast. That's why chocolate chip cookies tend to flatten out really easily. 
but don't do it from the refrigerator because then it takes forever and then your cookies aren't delicious because they're too doughy in the middle. And That's what kind of cookies you like. There's so much variability. <laughs> <laughs> Then you get it perfect, and someone's like, no, I like it crushy. And someone's like, no, I like it chewy. I'm like, go look at the cookie aisle at the grocery store. Like, there's like 5,000 different varieties of cookies because, you know, people like the variation. Yeah, and like those Toll Health cookies you can just like break apart. Sometimes they're not the best because they just take too long to, mm. to flatten out because they're cold. Yeah. You might have to like leave them at room temperature, but then you have the bacteria problem. Going Anything that's got sugar and chocolate in it, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question? Uh, yeah. So, Perhaps this is a foolish question, but let's see if you have a good response to it. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> Not that you, question. You've done a lot of experimentation in the kitchen. Um, yeah, a little bit. Any particular devices that you find really good for trying new things? Oh, particular devices. Um, I'm going to give you two different answers. One is kind of the generic, what do I think you should have if you're going to go and do experimentation in your kitchen? And the second is going to be, what do I miss in my kitchen now that I'm out in LA on a temporary basis? Um, if you're going to go do experimentation in your kitchen, um, just like any science, anything that gathers good data, so good scales, good, good thermometers, um, timers are kind of hard to find bad timers when you get one that most of the time. Um, but really, you know, um, understanding the, the temperature of the food temperature of the environment, how much weight-wise you're doing this stuff, and trying to control for it. Um, that, that really comes down to you know, the really key aspects. Um, so I did this talk last December on the, the science of chocolate chip cookies. And as part of it, um, we did an experiment where I had five different people bake batches of cookies, each of them being an A-B split experiment. Where it's like, OK, one person is going to make uh, two batches, one with um, whole wheat fl flour and one with regular flour. Or someone's going to make it with you know, um, melted butter versus you know, standard butter. And the reason I did um, each person doing two batches was to actually try to hold everything else constant on the basis that, hey, if one person's making both of these controls, you know, there's going to be variation between kitchen to kitchen, but variation between chef to chef, you know, you know, variation between each batch that one chef does should be a minimum. Um, so I wrote a very detailed protocol, writing everything out to the gram. And, like, this is actually for a bunch of chemists down in New York. It's like, Bunch of chemists given a protocol like this should be easy. <laughs> day day of the event comes up, and a couple of people kind of sheepishly come to me and said, "Yeah, I followed your protocol, but and I looked at the cookies and they were all over the board." And like I mean, I was trying to control for temperature, for weight, for everything. I'm like we're talking like a three-page bullet point, twelve-point single space list of like followed to the letter by you know PhD chemists, and I couldn't get them to actually within. Um, so. Even trying to control for, for time and temperature and weight and everything else, there's still so much variation that when you're trying to go and do an experiment, really understanding what variables you're capturing and recording and you're actually not missing bigger variables, like that's really the challenge. Um, as, as to the second bit, um, the second question I said in answer. So I'm out in LA on a, on a semi-temporary basis, um, enjoying the weather very much. I will say I left here December 18th and it started to snow December 19th. I apologize. <laughs> um, I miss my immersion stick blender. And it's kind of funny, because I, I have a confession to make. Um, I don't really have a kitchen out in LA. I have an uh, electric hot plate, <laughs> a toaster oven, and a microwave. And I'm kind of like, hey, if I can't make this work, you know, yeah, OK, I, I got to make this work. And it's been fine. It's actually worked just, I, I really haven't missed not having an oven or burners. But I have missed my immersion blender, because it's the one thing that kind of lets you like polarize and change texture and like you know, make smoothies or whatever, make soup. There's so many things you can do with that one tool. But I just, like, you know, I haven't been able to make soup and puree it for six months. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say that um, that's kind of been the surprise to me, uh, that, that particular tool, actually. It's kind of hard to, to fake it with something else. You can't take a knife and like dice stuff up small enough. Just, um, so yeah. Um, so another question? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go in. Okay. Um, actually, I haven't. So, I guess my question is, there's this other device that's kind of a totally different way of cooking things. It's not a putting something in a temperature bath, a microwave. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's cool about microwaves? Is there anything? Um, microwaves are kind of underappreciated. I mean, they're funda they fundamentally work by vibrating molecules in the North Pole. So things like water get hot when hit with microwaves, which means that essentially they're really only good for wet cooking methods. So if you want to steam some veggies, it works great. Take a container, put some veggies in there, maybe some asparagus. Close the container mostly, put a tablespoon or two of water on the bottom, 
and hit it with microwaves and like, you know, it'll steam up and, and it'll hot enough that this burger or whatever your veggies are will cook. Um, same thing like cakes. Like you can actually make chocolate cake in the microwave like in 30 seconds. You know, there's this whole theme here, 30 seconds, that's going on pizza, ice cream, and other cakes. Um, <laughs> you, you can make a cake in like, you know, 30 or 40 seconds. Again, because the microwaves are changing the water that are present in the eggs and the batter and setting them, causing them to vibrate, heat up and set. Um, that said, microwaves are not so useful for things that involve Maillard or caramelization reactions under normal circumstances. Um, there are probably some clever hacks involving like bizarrely foiled, um, creased foil, like in popcorn bags that industry manages to pull off. Um, so that's kind of why microwaves don't, you know, don't get the love that maybe they deserve because you can't get those other reactions, the dry cooking method reactions in them. Um, but you know, anything that involves liquid, any kind of wet cooking method. Seems like a reasonable guess that you should be able to do it with some form in the microwave. Um, I don't know if that gives you any inspiration. I don't think you make a pizza one, but you can definitely steam things, boil things. Um, potatoes, potatoes are great in microwaves. Because again, it's about taking the moisture that's present in the potato, getting the starches to kind of you know, dissolve and set back up. Um, you had a question? I was just going to ask if you had any tips for how the uh, inventive, intuitive, throw everything in a pan cook can describe how to cook to the precise I need a recipe cook. Uh, yes, innovative to traditional. Um, write it down and take really good notes about what you're doing. Okay, okay, take two, record you doing it, edit it down and give it to them. YouTube. Yeah, I'm going to just have you guys seen Drunken My Dragon Kitchen? Yeah. Oh, I love it. It's <laughs> great. Anyway, um, I, I'll hang out and sign some books for a while. I know we're probably at time. So um, with that, thanks for coming out.